have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open to the book of Mark, chapter 1. Now, I'm going to be comparing Matthew and Mark here because they have a very different way of sharing the gospel, despite the fact that most of the book of Mark is copied and pasted right into the book of Matthew. Matthew has a very different way of explaining and sharing the gospel. Now, when I was a kid, my parents uh, enrolled me in Aikido, which is a Japanese martial art. And when you study Aikido, there are two very different kinds of sensei. There's the kind that stands up there and explains every movement, every nuance of the technique to you. And then there's the kind that shows you three times and then says, now go and do it. Mark is that second kind of sensei. He gives you the story and he expects you to know all of the nuances of it. He doesn't go into detail. He doesn't give a whole lot of explanation. Matthew, on the other hand, quotes scripture left and right and tells you, and this is why Jesus did this, and this is why the Pharisees are saying this. Matthew goes into detail, but Matthew is very focused on prophecy. To Matthew, prophecy is not just a prediction, it's a pattern. It is the pattern of history. And it is fulfilled in its own day, but then we see it come up over and over again. So when Matthew says that Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy, he's not just saying that the prophecy predicted Jesus, because quite often in Matthew's Gospel, the prophecy doesn't predict Jesus. It doesn't even apply to Jesus. But in Matthew's Gospel, he tells us that Jesus fulfills it, that Jesus does it right. You see, in Mark's Gospel, we don't get that as much, but it opens with this story of John the Baptist preparing the way. And that John is predicted in the book of Isaiah. And this isn't exactly true, but once again, this is part of the pattern of history. This is John doing it for maybe the final time, maybe doing it right. Just as the prophecy was fulfilled in Isaiah's day, so too is it fulfilled in Jesus' day. But in verse 15, we see what it means for the prophecy to be fulfilled. Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, remember I said Mark doesn't explain a whole lot? Well, neither does Jesus right here. He tells them, without preaching a single word yet, he tells them to repent and believe the gospel. He hasn't delivered the gospel yet, right? He assumes that they know of what they need to repent. But as for the good news, well, he just gave that to them. The kingdom of God has come near. Now, this is a controversial phrase, the kingdom of God, because we think that the kingdom of God means something that is coming in some far distant future. But here Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is here now, today. And when he says that, it is 2,000 years ago. But just like the prophecies of old from his time, so too do prophecies continue to unfold throughout the pattern of history. The kingdom of God came near in Jesus' day, and it is still near today. And if you don't understand that just yet, if that doesn't quite make sense to you, don't worry about it, because it will. For now, it's important that we know that our calling is to repent and believe that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, he calls his first disciples, and then he goes and he starts establishing the kingdom. 
in verse 21, they go to Capernaum at the Sabbath, and they meet a demon-possessed man. Now, we have a very clear idea today of what it means for someone to be possessed by a demon. You might think of Hollywood movies. You might think of evil spirits, um, all sorts of things. But in Jesus' day, a demon just meant a god. So you would refer to Zeus or Hera or Apollo or even Hercules as a demon. These were things that people worshipped. Even Augustus Caesar could be referred to as a demon because Augustus Caesar considered himself a god. When Paul goes to the Ephesians and he goes to the temple there in Ephesus, he says, I see you're all very pious. You're all demon worshippers. Well, of course they're demon worshippers. They are worshipping the gods, the demons. So, when we see that someone is possessed by a demon, that means that their god is dwelling within them. But to the people of Israel, those gods are foreign. Those gods are not their god. And so they are impure spirits. When Mark is saying that this is a demon, he's saying this is not the spirit that should be in you. That spirit is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kadosh, the, in Hebrew, Holy Spirit, or the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God. But that's not what's in them. Now, how do they become demon-possessed? Perhaps by worshiping a foreign god. This had happened in Israel since the days of old. You know, in Jesus' day, it would have been the gods of Greece, but in the days of old, it would have, been the, would have been the gods of Canaan. And so this person is possessed by a demon, a god. And the demon-possessed man says to Jesus, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet said Jesus sternly, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Now here we see that Jesus is performing a miracle. He is casting out a demon, but he is also interacting with one particular group of Jews, those who claimed Hellenism as the source of their culture. And so in this way, we're going to see in the next two miracles, he addresses two other forms of Jewish thought. This first one is Hellenism, the idea that the Greek gods and Greek philosophy have a place in Israelite culture and in Israelite theology. He addresses this by casting out this demon, by bringing healing. So by casting out this demon, this impure spirit, this unclean spirit, Jesus does something else that's very important. You see, if someone is unclean, they cannot go to the temple in Jerusalem. They cannot worship God in all the ways that they are commanded to worship God. So by casting out this demon, Jesus has restored this person to their proper place in the community, not only with Israel, but with their God. Now, if we continue on to verse 38, we're going to see that this is not what Jesus intended his message to be, one of miracles. We see that when Simon comes, Simon Peter, comes looking for Jesus because Jesus has gone off to his solitary pray place to pray. And Simon Peter comes looking for him and saying, look, there's a bunch of people. They want healing. They want the miracles. That's why they're here. And Jesus replies to him, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. 
that's Jesus' purpose. So first we see the miracles, and then we see that what Jesus wants to be doing is to teach them. That is his purpose. But throughout Mark's gospel, we see miracles and teaching together. Remember that I told you, Mark doesn't tell you what Jesus means. He shows you. And he shows you a little bit and then expects you to understand. This is the little bit. Mark just showed you some miracles and says, and then Jesus says, let's go somewhere else. I want to preach. And from that little bit, we're supposed to understand Jesus's message, that healing and understanding God's word come hand in hand. And we can see this fully in Jesus's next miracle. In verse 40, still in chapter 1 here, verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now this is strange. Well, a couple things here. One, the man has leprosy, which in the New Testament, just like in the Old Testament, the words that are translated as leprosy actually applied to a variety of skin conditions. And whatever these skin conditions, they had the same outcome. The person was supposed to go outside the city. They were supposed to leave the city for a number of days and await healing. They were supposed to wash. They were supposed to do a certain number of things. And then they would have to go to the priest, present themselves, and be verified as healed. And when they presented themselves, they would bring an offering. And if they were wealthy, if they were, uh, if they were wealthy enough to have livestock, they would bring a larger offering. If they were poor, they could literally just bring two pigeons that they caught outside the temple. And if you've ever been around pigeons in a big city, you know they don't exactly try to get away from you. You can catch pigeons pretty easily if you tried. Please don't. They do carry a lot of diseases. But just have it in your head. If you were to try to catch pigeons, you probably could. Now, the other thing that someone who is unclean in this way is supposed to do, they're not supposed to approach people. They are supposed to tell them that they are unclean. These people can drop off food for them. They can, they can support this person who is hurting, but they cannot go near them because some of these skin conditions are in fact leprosy and they can be contagious. When he says this, the text tells us Jesus was indignant in the NIV. In some translations, it says Jesus was angry. Now, why is Jesus angry? Well, the man says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This is a statement. The man didn't act, actually ask anything, even though the text tells us he begged on his knees. He didn't really. He said, if you are willing, you can. This man is not asking Jesus for healing. He is asking Jesus whether or not that is, he is willing, whether he is willing, whether this is his purpose, whether he even has the power. And this makes Jesus angry because what do we know about Jesus? He is the Savior. In fact, his name, Yeshua, in Hebrew, it means he saves. So Jesus is angry. Of course he is willing. Of course he has the power because God has given him that authority. We see by his healings that God has given him the authority. 
He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Jesus is still angry <laughs> because this man is questioning whether or not he is willing. This man is questioning whether he has the authority. And he says to him, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Jesus is telling this man, listen, not only are you questioning me, but you aren't even doing what God told you to do. Not only from the start, he didn't declare he was unclean. He approached Jesus and he didn't give the sacrifices that God commanded. If he had just done as Moses commanded for his cleansing, he would already be healed. He wouldn't need to be very rude to Jesus. But we see that this isn't what the man does. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. When we question, is Jesus willing? Not only is he willing, he's willing to do it at his own personal expense. Because Jesus came to this town wanting to preach. And he just wants to tell them the good news. He just wants to tell them the word of God, what God wants for their lives. But God wants them to live a life that is full. And Jesus wants them to know that the commandments that Moses gave them, that is a big part of their lives. And he isn't coming to change that. And so he puts his own testimony at risk. He puts his own preaching at risk. He puts his own safety at risk to do good for people. Now, this second group we see are those who worship at the temple, who believe in the centrality of temple worship. That is what this second man represents. This third group we're going to see is the group of the Pharisees. And that is at the start of chapter 2. And <clears throat> when Jesus has finished his preaching in yet another nearby village, he goes to Capernaum. The people heard, well, let me just read it. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Now, I want you to notice that this is Jesus' home. This is his own house in Capernaum. Some of the men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And Jesus is preaching so much that people are lined up outside the door. They can't get this man near. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, their faith. They literally just cut a hole in his own roof. He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, 
what sins is Jesus talking about? It could be the sin of literally destroying his own property. That, that is the immediate sin between, that, that is the trespass or the debt or the sin, the wrongdoing between this man and Jesus. So we could interpret this as something that is between this man and Jesus, but he says it in a way that is actually quite vague. He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? I mean, can you blame them? He is talking in a very vague way. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And so the man did. Now, there's a few things going on here. One is that Jesus gives the same sermons over and over. I want you to notice that the, the book of Mark is very, very short. In fact, if I read the whole thing to you, it would take about two hours to read it. Jesus preached for three years. So it goes without saying, all of the teachings of Jesus are not contained in any of the Gospels. They layer the information in such a way that not only can you read it at the literal level, but there are allegorical levels. There's a, there is a sense of storytelling to it. So when Mark says that the teachers of the law were saying, why does this fellow think he can forgive sins? Note that this is a storytelling element. Why is this is this question placed into the mouths of the teachers of the law? Because anyone could say this. This could have been anyone. But we're told it's the teachers of the law. And in Jesus's day, these people, the teachers of the law, would have been the elders. And they were not only responsible for teaching the law, but also for representing people in court. So when someone went to court, the elders of their community, these teachers of the law, they would represent them. So these are, in, mo in a modern sense, these aren't just teachers, these are lawyers. And why are they threatened by Jesus' teaching that sins can be forgiven outside the court. The sin of this man against Jesus and Jesus forgives him. That's the point. These two didn't have to go to court for the man's sins to be forgiven. It was a simple matter between the man and Jesus. And Jesus preaches this later if someone is taking you to court, make peace along the way, because otherwise they will take everything from you. This is Jesus doing it very simple, very early on. And Mark tells us this in a way that is simple and quick, and we are really expected to dig into this, to know the context, to know what is going on. That's what's threatening these teachers of the law, is it's actually a very simple thing to forgive. And when forgiveness comes, you don't have to go through all the legal channels. You don't have to pay lawyers. You don't have to go before judges. You can work this out between yourselves and God will honor it. How does Jesus argue that? Well, he makes an argument that in Hebrew is 
called the Val Cahomer, from the lesser to the greater. And the lesser in this case is saying your sins are forgiven, the greater being the miracle of healing the man. And he says, which is easier, the lesser to say your sins are forgiven or the greater, get up, take your mat and walk. Because Jesus accomplishes the greater, we can know that he has the authority to do the lesser. It is a lesser thing to forgive someone than to bring them miraculous healing. No one can argue with that. And no matter what the teachers of the law say, it doesn't matter because when you have forgiveness, the law does not matter anymore. The law is there to set up justice, but justice itself, as we see here, is subordinate to mercy. And I want you to think about your own life in this. When are the times that you seek justice? Because justice is a great thing. It is the bedrock of our civilization. Could you have sought mercy? Because that is what we are called to do, to seek mercy first and to fall back upon justice. This is the calling of Jesus. This is how his miracles are set up. Look back to the healing of the man with leprosy. Now, justice would be to tell this man, go to the temple, give the sacrifices that Moses commanded of you, and God will heal you. Will heal you. This is exactly what Jesus should tell the man. Because if he did, if this man just did what was commanded of him, he would have his healing already. But Jesus, at great personal cost, heals the man first and then teaches him. Back with the man who is demon-possessed. Now, can Jesus teach a man who is demon-possessed? I don't know. Probably. The thing is, is this is really not the way our society thinks anymore. But I want you to think of it this way. The Holy Spirit that is within us is often called the Spirit of Truth. What are the other spirits? What are the demons of other gods? Because we could call the Holy Spirit the demon of truth. It's, it's a clumsy phrase, which is why we call the Holy Spirit exactly that, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of truth, because we know that the Holy Spirit is greater than any demon, because no demon contains the truth. So when this man is possessed by a demon in verse 21, he does not have the truth within him. Could Jesus teach a man like that? Not until that falsehood is purged. Today, we have people that run campaigns of misinformation. Now, these are demonic forces. They work against the spirit of truth. But how can we know the spirit of truth? First, healing has to come. And so that's where Jesus starts. He starts with healing, and then he teaches. Throughout Mark's gospel, we will see this exact pattern, that first healing comes. First, the demon possessed, the man who is paralyzed, the man with leprosy, they are restored to their proper place in the community, and only then can they be taught 
Brothers and sisters, I ask you, who is being cast out from your community? Are there people on the fringes? Are there people who don't know the truth because they cannot come near to where the word of God is preached? First, they have to be restored to the community. That is the healing that comes. Then, they can learn the word of God. The Holy Spirit itself can teach them. The spirit of truth, once it is within them, once they are within the community, once they have the spirit of truth, they can recognize what the truth is. And when they hear it, when they know that God is with them, well, brothers and sisters, we already know the irresistible call of the gospel. So that is my challenge to you today. How can you be more welcoming? How can you be more inclusive? Is there someone who is demon-possessed? Is there someone who is maybe not clean? Is there someone who is difficult to accommodate in so many ways. In any way you can think of, is there someone who you don't want to sit next to in the pew? Brothers and sisters, that is the call that Jesus gives us at the very start of Mark's gospel. Can you sit next to that person? Can you include them in your community? Can you serve that person and hold off on preaching? That is the call that the Spirit has given us. Now, if you haven't heard that call, if you don't know that Spirit, well then I invite you. I invite you to be baptized to be washed, to be clean, to cleanse away the spirit of misinformation, the spirit of falsehood, and to rise again clean and receive the spirit of truth. Brothers and sisters, whatever healing you need, whatever cleansing you require, that is the power of the gospel. That is the power of Christian community, which I invite you to come and enjoy. <laughs>